Hey everyone, this week's episode is brought to you by Coinbase Prime, Ledger, and Our Crowd. Really, really love these companies. Proud to call them sponsors. You're going to be hearing more about them later. But for now, on with the show. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the weekly roundup on On the Margin. Today, I'm joined by the one and only, the Mr. Jack Farley, aka Jack Attack. What's going on, Jack? I am doing great, Mike. I have to say, your regular co-host Mark Yusko is a legend of finance. So the fact that I'm sort of filling in for him, I just want to say, you know, I am not worthy. Uh, it's an honor, uh, but I will do my best. You and I have got what probably 50 charts to go through. I have to say. My timing is pretty good. I'm a lucky guy, Mike. We have had probably the most interesting mm. week in macro in definitely like eight months. I think this is the market responding, knowing that you were going to come up on the roundup uh, yeah. this week. Uh, this, is, this is really all about you at the it end was, of the day. It Jack, was priced in, Mike. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the collab though that we that we knew we needed, so I'm excited to get into it here with you today. And uh, as you said before, we do have a lot of great charts, so I'm just going to share my screen here. All right, so we got to start things off talking about this jobs miss, big big miss here. Uh, so we got two hundred two hundred ten thousand jobs added versus five hundred seventy three thousand expected. For those of you who are not following along with us here on YouTube, uh, we're actually we can are actually looking at a chart that's breaking this out by sector. Um, so I guess what are the first couple of things that pop to your mind, Jack, when you think about this week, this uh, big miss? It's the first big miss in a while. The job market has been on fire. Uh, we've had actually in uh, recently, you know, 4.4 million Americans quit their jobs, uh, which sounds bearish for the job market, but actually, you know, they're probably going to get higher. So that's actually, it's a sign of how much power workers have um, that they can quit their jobs. I always say, you know, 4.4 million people are fired. That is very deflationary, lots of power for employers, but 4.4 million workers quit their jobs. That is inflationary, a lot of power for workers. Uh, what interested me, Mike, is that you saw actually the 10 year spike higher on the news. And that's very interesting. It's sort of a, uh, it's, it's hard to interpret. I would say that perhaps uh, market participants were pricing in that this uh, uh, bad labor miss could allow the Fed to, if not delay its taper, then not accelerate it as Powell hinted earlier this week. Yeah, I think that's what it is. I mean, for me, whenever we're looking at jobs reports, the thing that I know that the Fed pays a lot of attention to is slack in the labor market in general. So, you know, for me, as, as much as you can possibly read the tea leaves, uh, so to speak, when it comes to the Fed, uh, you know, I think when you do see these these misses, um, then I, I, I completely agree with you. I think that gives them some sort of cloud cover. So I guess this jobs miss plus Omicron is going to allow Powell to get up there and say, actually, you know, uh, this economic recovery is not proceeding as quickly as we would have hoped. Um, and maybe we want to slow down, you know, the degree of what, to which we're tapering and slash potentially push rates further out into the future or the rate hikes further out into the future. So I, I think it kind of actually does give the Fed the cloud cover that they need. Uh, so, Mike, this is the news that came out today. We're recording this Friday, December 3rd. I believe this comes out tomorrow. So we're covering this the day of. But, mm -hmm. Mike, do you want to zoom over over the past week? Actually, let's wind back the clock eight days. You were uh, having Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. and suddenly you, you were seeing some things on Twitter about market volatility. Then on Friday, we had the ugliest day uh, in the stock market in quite some time. Uh, and definitely the, the, in the biggest rally in bonds, I believe, since March of 2020, when, when all this stuff happened. Uh, and then uh, over this week, uh, we've been up, we've been down. It's been very dramatic. Uh, what stood out to you? I think that the market just doesn't really know what it's thinking right now. So, I mean, to me, it almost looks like a mini rewind version of what happened when there have been previous variants in COVID in general. It's like the same thing happens, right? There's like a momentary panic followed by a, a large boom. And every single time, right, since the initial COVID shock and then you had Delta and now you've got Omicron, it, it's almost like that same thing is playing out uh, in history, just in a more muted type response. So, you know, I, we'll, we'll zoom ahead here to, um, I, I want to go back there, but the S&P actually dropped below its 50-day moving average, largely on the news that the first case of Omicron was reported in the US, which, you know, to me, you know, to me, my, my personal opinion is that just seems like a bit of an overreaction, right? It's it's way too early that the, the data is still very mixed on Omicron. You know, what we're hearing right now uh, from doctors out of South Africa is that it looks like this might be slightly more transmissible, but ultimately the symptoms are much more mild in general. You know, you are hearing from the CEO of pharmaceutical companies like Moderna, 
that this might require a new vaccine. I don't know if you actually caught this from the Daily Show. Trevor Noah is saying, uh, hey, guys, uh, you know, he, he did it much more funny than, than I'm going to say. Uh, but he was basically like, look, is this guy really the most non-biased oh, yeah. <laughs> person uh, you know, to be giving you this information? Yeah. Uh Maybe let's turn our thinking caps on here a little bit. I mean, Mike. To be fair, he he. I mean, he only owns two hundred million dollars worth of the stock that went up eleven percent. I mean, come on. It's, it's... <laughs> yeah. So that's my interpretation. I don't know. What do you think, Jack? I I totally ha- have had that thought about the CEOs of Moderna and Pfizer. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the vaccines a huge gift to humanity. Really, really brought uh, saved a lot of human lives. Brought us out of the economy of, of of you know economic devastation. Allowed us to reopen. But yes, I think that. Uh, when the CEO of a company makes a statement, they generally do so in a way that is inc- favorably inclined to their company. And, you know, if the CEO of, what is it, Kimberly Clark says that, uh, you know, people are, you know, people people are buying lots of wipes, people are buying lots of, of tissues uh, because of COVID. Like, you know, people, people understand that a CEO is going to, you know, when, when, the, when the CEO of Ford Jim Farley, by the way, no relation, says that the future of electric vehicles is in America and it's Ford. Like we we get it that he's talking his book, but when when we hear this, mm-hmm. uh, you know, doctor who has the CEO of Moderna, we're like, oh wow, this is, you know, it's an, an unbiased uh, uh, source. So I will also say, um, I've uh, you know interviewed an analyst who has a lot of done a lot of work on Moderna, and he basically said, uh, or this is my interpretation, that. Moderna was priced uh, for two possible outcomes. Number one is that it is going to continue to sell $6 billion a year of COVID vaccines ad infinitum. Or number two, that uh, it's basically going to discover a, a, a vaccine for cancer. So I, I think like if, if COVID is the new normal and it's epidemic, which it very well could be, um, you know, then, then yeah. that could be priced in the stock. But if, as some people believe, um, and you know, Omicron challenges not ch- challenges narrative, but like in two years, everything will be back to normal, fully back to normal, then that yeah, the the inflated uh, uh, price of, of Moderna seems a little bit inflated. Um, but yeah, so th- so that's about about Moderna. Let's see. I also am thinking a lot about bonds and particularly the flattening of the yield curve. And I would say it's been a bear flattener. Yes, yields on the long end have gone down. But the most dramatic action has been the rising of rates on the short end of the curve. And that has been basically pricing in that the Fed is going to ease its monetary policy, excuse me, tighten its monetary policy, hasten the pace of a taper, and ultimately get to uh, raising rates. I understand you, this, this chart is fantastic. Uh, can you explain what's going on here? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we, we don't really have a chart of the, the yield curve here, but this this one comes to us from Jim Bianco, uh, just one of my all-time favorites. Um, and basically what you're looking at here is uh, the last 20 years of the 10-year yield, right? And you're also looking at these kind of colorful extrapolations are a survey of professional forecasters of what the yield is going, uh, the yield, yields are going to do. So basically for the last 20 years, uh, the summary of this chart is that, you know, professional forecasters have been saying exactly what you just said, you know, that, uh, bonds are, you know, this, 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 uh, 40 year, uh, bull, bull rally, bull market and bonds is going to end, uh, yields are going to turn back up. And basically for at least the last 20 years, they have just been absolutely dead wrong because it has been a steady march down in terms of yield. So I don't know. I mean, you and I were just having this conversation the other day about where do bonds really go from here? What is TLT going to do? The answer is, I don't really know. It has been a very, very consistent, even if you look past this chart to a 200-year history of real rates in the U.S., I mean, it's been a pretty steady march one way down, uh, especially if you look at this chart nominally as well. So not real rates, but nominal rates uh, that exclude CPI. I don't know. Um, You know, I I think a lot of this comes down to, and uh, Eric Townsend over at Macro Voice has done a great job of framing this debate in terms of, are we going to cross the zero lower bound in the United States? Because everything really trades off the tenure in general. So I don't know. I mean, I guess for me to, for the bond rally to continue to extend itself, you would need to cross the zero lower bound in the U S that would, a lot of people would just go and say that's impossible. But you know, 20 years ago, you would have said the amount of negative yielding debt in the world is completely nonsensical and and, and impossible as well. So I'm not really sure. (laughs) What do you think about bonds as an asset class right now? I got a lot of thoughts. So at yeah, first, so I have a theory. It's not really serious, but 
what if the reason that these bank economic forecasters are always uh, forecasting that yields are going to rise is because they're getting taps on their shoulder from the sales and trading teams from the bank saying, hey, you got to get your folks out of bonds and put them into equities because that's where the real juice is for us. Um, so I, 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 mm. I, that theory popped through my head. I think it's, it's always, it's always uh, exciting to think about bonds selling off and yields rising because if that were to happen, well, uh, you know, then the, the, that means the economy is doing really well. Uh, likely cyclical stocks are doing well, and it's just a, a, a good economic time. I think that what has propelled the bond market rally over the past 40 years has not just been secular disinflation, but also the sort of cementing of the U.S. dollar as the world reserve currency and specifically as a collateral mm -hmm. that uh, is required to be lent against. Uh, so in other words, you have to own it. And, and also... Since 1987, uh, uh, treasury bonds, particularly in the longer end of the curve, have been very negatively correlated with stocks. And if you think, think of a negative correlation as an insurance policy, right? Like the, if you own an insurance uh, contract off for your car, that you, the amount of money that you get, like a good thing will happen for, if you get money from the insurance contract, that, that will happen with a bad thing happens to your car. So that's a negative correlation. Generally, insurance, you have to pay for it. So like if you buy calls on the VIX or if you buy puts on the S&P, you're paying for uh, insurance. When you buy bonds, it's what's called a, po not what's called, it's, people call it as a positive carry put. You're getting paid 1.5, 2%. Uh, in income, at, but also when stocks sell off, uh, bonds will rally, meaning yields will uh, will fall. So there have been many attractive reasons to own bonds. In fact, uh, there's a, a lot of people noticed this and said, "Hey, what if we take this 60/40 portfolio where we have 60% stocks, ballasted by 40% bonds, where if stocks sell off, bonds will be there to protect them, and then you'll generate cash to buy back on the dips." What if we take that to its logical extreme and we do something called risk parity, where we bought, we take $100, right. we borrow an additional $100, uh, uh, um, and we buy 120% of stocks and 80% bonds. So you're, you're, fully, you're fully hedged. You, um, and if bonds and stocks sell off together or rise together, then, and the, the correlation turns positive, then a lot of fundamental assumptions of modern portfolio theory would disintegrate and it would mean a lot of problems for the financial system and particularly hedge funds. I want to get into hedge funds later because a lot of uh, the stocks that are, have been owned by hedge funds have been battered. And because hedge funds run these uh, levered books, you know, sometimes two, three, four times levered, if they own Zoom and Zoom goes down, that means they have to cover their short in AMC. I'm, I'm just making a name like that. So you have all sort of these re reverberations. Um, so yes, we have seen a bull flattener, excuse me, a bear flattener of the U.S. yield curve. And I think, uh, Mike, that long-term mm. rates might head lower for a little bit, but I think ultimately their trajectory over the next two years, I, ha I think will be higher. I think, and I think that the risk reward for bonds is bad, not only because on an absolute return basis, but also because there's a pos possibility of them being positively correlated with stocks, so they're no longer that insurance policy. And that has to do with inflation, and that is relying on the work of Harley Bassman, who you recently interviewed, uh, as well as Gerard Minak. My rant is over. Mike, your thoughts? <laughs> All right, lots on back there. Yeah, I, I like the connection between uh, the 60-40 portfolio and risk parity. You know, maybe risk parity is like the, the institutional version of that, but it rests on the same assumption, right, which is this negative correlation between stocks and bonds. It's interesting. Uh, so Harley talked about this. Urian Timmerer, uh, who's a, an analyst at Fidelity, pointed this out as well, which is actually that CPI has an impact on that negative correlation, right? So the last 40 or 50 years, when Ray Dalio pioneered that uh, risk parity strategy, which has been criticized as just basically being a levered up bond portfolio, but uh, whatever, it's been a money, minter, uh, money printer uh, for the last however many years he's been doing it. But actually, you know, when you look back to periods like the 1970s or the 1940s, when CPI was actually running hotter, that negative correlation reversed. And to your point, stocks and bonds did become correlated. So it's hard to really emphasize how problematic this would be for the financial system in general, because so much money is basically, you know, invested based on this assumption that that's true. So I guess 
you know, I, I want to get to two big things here, which is you just said that you expect rates to rise, especially on the long end. So there are two big problems with that, which is one, if, uh, if let's say inflation were to run hot, rates were to rise, then that would you basically have to unwind that entire strategy, both the 60-40 portfolio on the retail side and the risk parity strategy on the institutional side. So I, I don't know what you think the result of that would be, but I think havoc uh, is probably a good word. And then there's this other kind of narrative, which is that, look, the Fed ultimately can't allow rates to rise that much because it would make the debt servicing costs that we have just completely unbearable. I don't even know what debt to GDP is right now. I think it's like 130% or something like that. It's the highest that it's been since World War II. And you've got this pretty interesting chart here where you're looking at what the impact would be of rates on the 10-year, I believe, going 1% higher, 2% higher, 3% higher. These are huge, huge numbers, right? Uh, you know, 1% you know, higher is like 530 billion, 2% higher, 750 billion, 3% higher, 975 billion. You know, it's like that old quote, right? Uh, you know, a couple billion and you're <laughs> starting to suddenly talk about real numbers. So I don't know. What, what do you think? It, I do sympathize with the idea that the Fed does really seem trapped in that they can't allow almost like normal market conditions to return because they're in such a bind. I don't know. That was my own rant right back at you, but I don't know. What do you think about what comes to mind when you when you look at this chart? Howdy, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Coinbase Prime, the leading prime brokerage solution for all things digital assets, providing secure custody, trading, and financing to an institutional suite of clients. On the retail side of things, I am more than happy to make this endorsement because I have been a custody, customer of Coinbase since the day that I got into crypto. I still keep the vast majority of my assets there, actually, and I do it for one reason and one reason alone, so that I can sleep easy at night knowing that my funds are safe. It's the same reason when family or friends ask me, where should I buy my first Bitcoin? I direct them to Coinbase. And now, finally, when institutions are starting to ask, what's the most safe infrastructure to use? I only point them in one direction, to Coinbase Prime. And the reason that I do that is because it is peace of mind. When it comes to security, Everything is top of the line on this platform, and it's a white glove experience to boot. They've been securing client assets at scale for eight years, which as of Q2 of this year is $180 billion. They have an industry-leading insurance policy, and they're audited by blue chip auditors so that you can sleep easy at night too. So stop listening to me, click the link at this bottom of this episode, and go check them out for yourself. And when you get there, tell them that I sent you because I love to get credit. Your rant was much more concise, I would say. Uh, but so I, I, I'm, I have a lot of volume I, in terms of. Uh, uh, so let's see. I think that viewers of this program who are, you know, very familiar with macro might know that the Federal Reserve has an official dual mandate uh, to maintain a, mm -hmm. a good labor market and also to have price stability. So uh, you know, a lot of higher, uh, low unemployment rate relatively and uh, excuse me, uh, moderate inflation. As of last year, the Fed has actually said, we want to uh, prioritize the labor market because of the labor market scarring because of COVID yeah. and inflation is on the back burner. Now, the inflation thing has run so hot. Uh, they're saying, we, we, we're not going to fire until we see the whites of the eyes of inflation. I saw someone on Twitter saying, well, the <laughs> army is in the castle. Like, you got to start shooting, Jay Powell, you know? Um, however, yeah. people uh, may also have heard that there is a hidden, so-called hidden mandate of the Fed, which is the Greenspan hmm. put, the Powell put. You can't have asset markets tank because of something called the wealth effect. If you know, it's if Mike, if you have assets uh, and they they go up a lot in price, you f are wealthier and you feel wealthier because you are on paper, and therefore you will spend. And if your wealth goes down, you will contract spending. So if the market were to tank 60%, I mean stocks, and the market were to tank 60% and it were to stay down 60% and you wouldn't have a sharp V upwards, then that could uh, start a daisy chain of unwinding uh, where you know wealthy people who are typically people who own assets, they are, are a lot uh, less wealthy, so they uh, start you know, letting people go. They stop spending less, and then it's just sort of it unravels from there. So that is sort of the, the what what I've heard people call to as the third hidden mandate. But I've actually got a fourth hidden mandate, which I actually think is the most important, the most uh, primal model of the Federal Reserve. And it actually was you know, one of the reasons why it actually was started. The Federal Reserve was not started to help the labor market. The Federal, the Federal Reserve was. Uh, started to stem banking panics and serve yeah. as a lender of last resort. Yeah. 
and also to maintain a market. And this actually goes back before the Federal Reserve to the second bank of the United States, um, which, which I actually you know, wrote my thesis on uh, in, in college. And that, um, you mm. know, it was to ma- uh, maintain a stable market for treasury, the, tre- the U.S. Treasury market, so that the sovereign, mar- sovereign uh, government could issue bonds and they wouldn't have a debt crisis. They wouldn't have to issue it at 30% and basically have anyone who's buying bonds be a loan shark, which is what happened you know, before the U.S. when you had the, the, uh, the Continental Crisis. Basically, uh, people were funding the U.S. Revolutionary Army with money uh, with, with, by, by buying bonds. And you know, ultimately, the, the, un, unsurprisingly, the uh, credit quality deteriorated and you, you had very, very high yields on that debt. That, that, they do not want that to happen. So... Yield, you know, you know, people are saying, oh, my God, the bond market the, uh, is rallying. Yields are the, the 30 year is now at one point seven percent. The Fed must be terrified because the market is pricing in deflation it's growth. It's like, no, the Federal Reserve is very happy because they uh, are working for essentially the Treasury and the Treasury can issue money at very, very low rates. So that is my sort of conspiracy theory. Uh, and also, particularly if you mm-hmm. look at and I did some work on this last night, if you look at what happened to the treasury market during March. Treasuries are a risk off asset, right? Because they're the safest assets in the world. And uh, typically when you have a risk on event that is deflationary. So that means that my, the, what you're being paid back in bonds will, will actually be very valuable because it won't be inflated away. So, oh my God, bond, you know, 30 year bond yields, 2%. How about 1%? I don't care. But actually from like March 13th to March 23rd, so that's what happened prior to March 13th. But from March 13th to 23rd, you had incredible illiquidity in the funding markets for the Treasury. And uh, basically, you know, swap spreads blew out of proportion. And people were selling Treasuries because they needed dollars so badly that they were selling Treasuries in order to raise dollars. So it's like when you, uh, dollars, uh, Treasury ceased to be a risk off asset. So let me, mm-hmm. Mike. So I, I once again have I'm, my lack of concision. Let, let me let me respond to some. Of, let me respond to some of what you said. So uh, I think in terms of the the wealth effect, that I mean that gets pointed out on financial podcasts like this. We've talked about it on the show a bunch of times. I think that is one of the most important dynamics to understand uh, that isn't widely understood today. Which is there's this huge correlation. It's like sixty five percent or something like that in between consumer spending and the price of stocks. That's why guys like Luke Roman say there's really no difference between the stock market and the real economy. They're highly, highly correlated at this point. And to me, that's just a really good example of you know this is a crypto show too. We talk a lot about governance and money, right? That's a central theme to Bitcoin. It's a you can see I think that that decision was made with good intentions. Right, you you could you could see how that decision gets made. Look, guys, we uh, we're going to lean to we're going to support asset prices here. I think price stability is one of the the dual mandates of the Fed. So we're going to support prices here. Maybe we'll lean and support them a little bit too much, but ultimately it's going to be good because that's going to cause consumer spending and real growth in the economy, etc. The downside effect is that it has obviously created enormous wealth inequality in the form because the only the wealthiest people tend to own stocks, right? So they disproportionately benefited from that from that plan and. You know, when you look at the group of people who are making that decision and weighing those trade-offs, honestly, it's a bunch of old, wealthy white guys. And by the way, they weren't behaving in a super scrupulous manner. Look at the departures that have happened in the Federal Reserve this last year. So I totally agree, Jack. I think that's one of the most important things that folks need to understand, that that is a a huge factor that's underpinning a lot of the decision uh, making that's coming out of the Fed. And by the way, I think actually those underfunded pensions are now funded. It's been like a record year for endowments and pensions overall. So in a weird way... It's kind of worked in general. Yes. And when stocks go up so much as they have and pensions are fully funded, what can they finally do? They can sell their stocks and buy bonds to rebalance. I think that has been somewhat mm-hmm. of a driving factor for the rally in long-term yields. I mean, uh, yields going down over the past, uh, let's say, eight months. Yeah. So let's. I, I want to move on to um, the stock market here a little bit. So we're looking at the, the S&P here and it's moving below its... Uh, 50-day moving average. Here's a chart of uh, U.S. major stock indices, um, basically in in the the last two weeks uh, leading up to now, or the last month or so. So you've actually seen, you know, with this kind of Omicron panic, you've actually seen the Dow uh, sell off much more than other major indices. Uh, you know, the Nasdaq. I, th- this one actually didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. Okay, so, so, yeah, this doesn't this didn't really make much sense to me at all. Okay, so in in previous COVID type panics. 
right? What you've basically seen is actually the NASDAQ, you know, which has these stay at home stock darlings actually end up doing quite well. So when I look at this chart, kind of like, okay, if we're worried about COVID, right, which people associate with lockdowns, the closures of business, et cetera, it makes sense to me that the Dow would sell off harder than something like the NASDAQ. But you actually put together this great chart, which is uh, the S&P versus kind of some of the stay at home darlings in general, right, which is Peloton, Zoom, DocuSign. It's been absolute bloodbath, DocuSign today. It's down like 40%, I think, at the time of our recording here, because, you know, some of the demand that maybe got pulled forward from COVID is dissipating. So to me, this tells kind of a different story than this previous chart that we're looking at. If the Dow is selling off harder than the Nasdaq, okay, I get that. That makes sense. But then why are these stay-at-home darlings getting absolutely obliterated? Any thoughts here? Yes. Uh, can, can you go back a chart? I think that the uh, mm -hmm. outperformance of the Nasdaq over the Dow has been a staple over the past 10 years for secular reasons, such as low inflation, uh, uh, you know, technology stocks doing very well. Also, the, the Dow Jones, a very old stock index, is kind of a uh, outre, let's put it that way. I think that you know it has only 30 stocks. And like, so the S&P 500 is constructed by uh, uh, market cap. So the biggest stock is number one. Apple is the biggest uh, holding. It's like 6% of the index, maybe more, a little bit. Um, do you want to guess mm. what the largest holding in Dow Jones is? And by the way, I should say, Mike, you, there's no way you're going to get it. And you know, no one would know this unless they look this up. So don't feel bad about not getting it. <laughs> All right. I'm not, I'm not even going to trust. It's United Health Group Incorporated. Yeah. And that's because really? they, they, ha they take the 30 stocks. I don't know exactly how they choose them, but they say the ones that are the most expensive in terms of price to buy one share is the biggest one. So if, you know, Ippolito Incorporated is $700 and Apple is a hundred and, <laughs> and, and Apple is $160, Ippolito will be a, a larger holder than Apple. And that's exactly what you find. Like Caterpillar mm. 3M, which is, you know, makes like industrial parts. These are, are, are larger weighting uh, in the index than Apple. So, but, but the Dow Jones is typically thought of as like, oh, it's industrial. So it's cyclical. So they have like steel and all these things. And typically that's how they typically trade. So I wasn't shocked when the NASDAQ sold off less than the Dow. But did you, sorry, did you have thoughts? No, I, I agree with that. I actually, I remember, I, you know, I, can't really remember how these indis different indices get uh, calculated, but that makes sense. They're doing it based on share price instead of market cap, because the, I, I remember reading about this when GE got kicked out of the Dow, and that was like end of an era uh, type thing. But okay, so so makes so so basically, what you're saying is that there are kind of two things that are going on here. One, there's this maybe temporary COVID scare in the form of Omicron, right? And then there's also these larger secular trends. So, am I interpreting your interpretation correctly? Then that. I think the market is kind of actually on team transitory then in general, because if the, I feel like if the market did believe that inflation was going to be persistent, then you would start to see more pullbacks in the NASDAQ. And that's not really what you're seeing. So it looks like just a continuation of the trend that we've had, the deflationary trend that we've had the last 20 years. I have no doubt that the, that you're absolutely correct, that the market is on team transitory and it's gotten more, excuse me, it's gotten more team transitory over the past month. Uh, we don't have this chart, but I can put yeah. it up. We can put it up later of the 10 year inflation break even, which is what the market is, quote, pricing in inflation will be over the next 10 years. When you, by the way, when you hear the term real yield, like real yields are super low, what Mike put up, what we put up earlier was the uh, nominal treasury yield minus real inflation. And now that would be, well, I don't know, yep. negative five, negative 6%, very, very low, perhaps even lower than it was in yep. 78, whatever. But. Often the tips yield is the nominal yield minus what the market thinks inflation will be over the next 10 years, which on a duration sense kind of is more accurate. Uh, inflation break evens are relatively low so that, uh, you know, even though tips yields are negative, they're, they're only like negative 1%. So uh, we can show on this chart now that inflation break evens have actually declined. And that's related to, uh, you know, the VIX exploding higher, which we can get into. It's oil selling off violently, which we can get into. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. on the next chart, I think even though you're seeing a lot of panic, there's Omicron, and I think you know it's, it's very easy to get so hung up in the, in the narratives. Um, the S and P 500 is is only down 2.46 percent from all time highs. So what's remarkable to me is how mm -hmm. the VIX exploded higher to 26, 27, 28, even as the underlying index hold held firm. However, even though the true, even though the surface of the S&P 500 is relatively 
placid underneath the water there are a lot of sea monsters and you can see the sort of sea monsters below actually the ocean can be that see that blue line the s&p 500 and below the blue water ocean you see all those sea monsters like docusign which sold off 40 percent over the past 24 hours after reported earnings which is crazy and we've had other mm -hmm. that like beyond meat uh uh chegg Peloton, many other stocks selling off uh, violently, and you can see Peloton there. Zoom, by the way, why is Zoom so doing so poorly? Zoom is the stay-at-home darling. We are recording this on Riverside, but if we weren't recording this on Riverside, we'd be recording this on Zoom. When we spoke to prepare for this on last Zoom, night, yeah. we were speaking on Zoom. Zoom seems a better Omicron hedge to me than TLT. When it comes to crypto, security and custody is paramount. Introducing this episode's sponsor, Ledger, your secure gateway to buy, exchange, and grow your crypto assets. I know I've got a smart audience, so I'm assuming slash hoping that most of you already have your Ledger hardware wallet, but just in case you don't, this is how I think about it. I wouldn't get into a car if I couldn't wear a seatbelt, and I don't operate in crypto unless I can do it from my Ledger hardware wallet. Crypto is really exciting, but it is still the Wild West. There are lots of risks, and Ledger is the easiest way to make sure that you are still protected. And the best part about Ledger is that you don't need to make any trade-offs between security of your funds and utility of your assets because Ledger has Ledger Live, which is a software that syncs right up to your Ledger hardware wallet, and you can do anything that you'd want to do with your crypto assets. You can easily send and receive, you can buy and exchange, and you can get access to staking. And they've actually started to aggregate some of the best DeFi apps and services out there. Two of my favorites, Paraswap, a decentralized aggregator, and they've got Lido for staking. And stay tuned, I'm going to keep you guys updated. They've got some really cool services uh, coming out soon. Aave, Compound, and One Inch among them. So if you take one thing away from this, guys, please, please, please make sure that you're protected in this space. Get yourself a Ledger hardware wallet today and start using the Ledger Live app. Click the link at the bottom of this episode. Thank me later. All around the world, tech companies are innovating and driving returns for investors. Our crowd takes a global bird's eye view of private markets and brings the companies with the greatest growth potential to you to invest in. One of my favorite quotes from Jim Bianco is when he says, I hate it when people tell me to invest like Warren Buffett. I wish I could invest like that guy. He sees all the best deals. Well, our crowd is addressing exactly that issue by bringing private companies to you when you can take advantage of them, i.e. when they're still early. Our crowd's accredited investors have already invested over $1 billion in growing tech companies, and many have benefited from the 46 uh, IPOs or otherwise sale exits that they've experienced on the platform. Join the fastest growing venture capital investment community at ourcrowd.com slash OTM. Again, that is ourcrowd.com slash OTM. If you take one thing away from this, be it that you should include OTM when you join our crowd. We'll see you soon. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree with you. I, I don't. And by the way, point, point this out to listeners as well. This chart is showing the percent off in terms of all time high, right? So these aren't actual um, absolute percentages, so to speak. So it's a discrepancy between the 52% uh, drop that we're showing here for DocuSign versus the 40% sell off that they've, that they've had today. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think overall, you know, our, our, our friend Byron here who writes BlockWorks newsletter, I, he had this line that I really liked in one of his old newsletters, which was as a trader, you know, it's, it's every human's instinct to, when they disagree with the market, to try to think why the market might be wrong. And he's got this great line about as a trader, I, I, I shifted that view and I started to try to think why, what am I missing? What is the market telling me that I'm just not believing? And, you know, I, I try to keep it honest on the show. I, I think I'm, I'm guilty of everyone else and just flip-flopping, right, in terms of uh, my own conviction on things like uh, inflation versus deflation. And when Tyler and I used to do this show a couple months ago, he was kind of consistently team inflation. I was consistently team deflation. I will admit I've been spooked just like anyone else for the last couple last couple months of these insane CPI prints. Also, just on a personal level, you know, I'm a creature of habit. I I, I have like the same three lunch places, you know. I, I'll, I'll get like uh, – a sushi from Whole Foods or, or Poke Works or, or a salad or something like that. Um, man, I really eat a lot of fish. But I, I, I've, I just noticed that these, you know, the Poke Bowl I used to get was $16 and now it's nineteen ninety nine, And, you know, it's – so I, I kind of feel like things that I'm seeing in my life are more expensive. And one thing that I've just always objected to, and there's a guy named Diego Perea who says this really well, is that the very first lie that the Fed tries to tell you is that inflation is one number. 
it's different for everyone, right? So, you know, and, and by the way, if, if you don't believe me, go look up what the buckets are that get included in the Fed's core PCE, right? Which is their favorite measure of inflation, core inflation. They got some stuff in there that I just don't spend money on on any sort of regular basis at all. And it excludes the, quote, volatile price of food and gasoline. It's like, what? Dude, how, how then how is that a representative, you know, measure for for my life in general? So it's my kind of rant about just inflation in general. I it, it's hard for me to I don't know. Logic says I, I, I understand why inflation pressures might ease the second half of this year, right? Even if you just look at the chip shortage in general, right? There are these like fields of cars in Michigan, right? Uh, that, that are just waiting for these chips. And I, I could see a whole a whole ton of supply coming online later and you know, global supply chains, they're, they're a tricky beast, but ultimately these issues do tend to work themselves out through them. It takes some time, but they eventually do happen. So basically, I just try to be honest about how conflicted I am about this. I don't actually have strong conviction either way. And if you listen to our, our, our mutual friend, Lynn Alden, she's got some great thoughts actually about how inflation ended up playing out in the 1940s and how it was actually basically staggered where there'd be these bouts of inflation and then it would kind of level off and bouts of inflation and then it would level off. So it, it might not be as, as easy as just constant or consistent inflation or consistent deflation. It might just be a little topsy-turvy for a little while. That was a rant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. And Mike, I think that if you look at the 1940s, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, Lynn Alden's theory, the Federal Reserve did not uh, fire in the eyes of inflation. It did not raise rates. In fact, it, it enacted yield curve control to cap bond right. yields, note yields all across the curve so that the treasury could essentially fund itself well below the cost of inflation to have a persist, a persist, a decade of persistently low real yields, which if you're the government, that's exactly, it's exactly what you want. I mean, that's the oldest game in town. I, I believe it's called seniorage when you can you know, issue, issue a paper bill for a hundred dollars and it costs way less to make that bill. Like that, that's what the treasury wants. So Lynn's theory is that in the 1940s, uh, treasury the fed did nothing to fight inflation, but in the, uh, unlike in the 1970s and specifically they referred to 1979 to 1982, where Paul Volcker was a, you know, a real gangster and just jacked rates up to unbelievable levels and caused <laughs> two recessions. And in fact, he was, you know, there were protests in the street to, to fire Paul Volcker. Um, and I can't imagine, I can't imagine Powell doing that. Yeah. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that now? I mean, think about how nuts that is. Think about how little tolerance the Federal Reserve has for any sort of market sell-off whatsoever. And then think about what Volcker did back in the 80s. I mean, that's nuts. It just seems like we, we've never seemed like we're further away from that than we are today. Yeah. And also, if rates were to be uh, not move in inflation, so if the uh, 30 year never budged above 2%, even as we had six, seven, eight percent over the next decade, that wouldn't that 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 would be bad for bonds in the long term, because if you owned a 30 year bond and then you redeemed it at 30 years at that value of your cash would have been have been inflated away dramatically, but your bond wouldn't have sold off. Yields wouldn't have surged higher, so you wouldn't you would feel like you were winning, even mm. though at the end of the day you really wouldn't. Also, on the equity market, yeah. equities live in a nominal world. Equities aren't thinking about uh, you know the uh, real rates necessarily. They're thinking a, a discount rate where you discount future cash flows back to the present. You know because a million dollars. 10, 10 years from now is worth much less than a million dollars now. If that discount rate is very low in nominal terms, this equity bull market could continue to have legs to it. But then now let's talk about inflation and the fundamentals. For over the past year, producer price indi indices have been much higher than consumer price indices. So essentially companies are paying more to make their products and they're able to pass on only a fraction of that cost to consumers. And you've seen that hurt margins, uh, particularly in this in this fourth quarter. Where, where do you think the, the equity? How do you think the equity market will, will react? Kind of like it's been doing, which is basically up only. I, you know, I, I don't know. There is that whole Von Mises crack up boom theory. You know, Eric Townsend talks about this a lot on Macro Voices. I'm not sophisticated enough to know where the equity market is going to go from here. 
I will say, when you look out into the world, everything just looks pretty expensive, doesn't it, in general? It's not like any asset class is looking particularly cheap outside of maybe commodities right now. But like, even take a look at this chart. So you're looking at rolling 12-month flows into equities. This comes to us from uh, B of A's Global Investment uh, Strategy Group. And the inflows over the last 12 months exceed previous inflows from the past 19 years combined. It's insane. I mean, the, the, the numbers that we're seeing are just absolutely insane. So, you know, I do sympathize with this idea that there's got to be a pullback. But I also kind of sympathize with this Luke Roman idea that maybe what we're looking at is the first bubble in sovereign bonds uh, in the last 80 years and the commensurate rise in asset classes that accompany that because basically everything trades off the U.S. tenure. So I, I just it's hard for me to really know where we're going to go from here. Um but what I certainly wouldn't be doing is taking out any shorts on equities because it looks quote unquote expensive. I think it's been nuts and I think it's been nuts for a while. And, you know, the one thing that guys who I follow in macro that I really respect say is that it can get a whole lot crazier, uh, you know, and, and macro theses always take longer to play out than you think they're going to. And to compound on that and just give you a sense of how crazy things really are, you know, you can take a look at average daily options volumes. So this is the last three weeks leading up to November 15th. Take a look at Tesla compared to the rest of the market. Tesla, options volume in Tesla alone, that one name, trades more than the entire TMT. So that's technology, media, and entertainment sector. Trades more than Amazon. And then look at all other stocks combined. All other stocks combined wow. is about half of Tesla's volume. This comes to us from Goldman Sachs. So, I mean, these are truly, truly nuts numbers. And this chart's another way of framing it as well, um, which is basically just... Uh, you know, Tesla options activity, look at how crazy this looks like as an outlier, right? So you got Amazon and AMD are the only two other, other two uh, numbers on that chart. But I don't know, man, I, I think these are all just symptoms of froth. But I think it's very tempting to look at a market like this and say, oh, this has to reverse. But it, it's tough to get the timing right on these things. And I, I, I just don't know. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, so te I think Tesla, that's really remarkable because Tesla is an expensive stock. It's at $1,000, $1,100, somewhere around there. So the options are expensive. If you want to buy a six-month option that's like even out of the money, not not ridiculously out of the money, that costs like $10,000 because it, it would be $100, but then you got to multiply by 100 because it's a... Right. Uh, so it's $10,000. So I don't know if the retail crowd is has enough money to buy those Tesla options uh, or if they're just crazy and they're just, just buying... You spend, they're investing their entire portfolio in extremely in weekly options that are out of the, very out of the money. That certainly, of course, is possible. But I, I think what really drew investors mm. originally to GameStop and AMC was they were ridiculously cheap. You can buy, you know, anyone can right. buy an option on GameStop on a four dollar stock. You know, uh, so that that is remarkable. That Tesla is greater than all other stocks. Uh, that it that is wild. I, you know, I uh, have not been a bull on Tesla, so I've totally missed that ride. Uh, and I, I continue to not be a bull, but I, I may miss yet another ride. Mike, we haven't talked about crypto. I'm, 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 I'm sort of you know, dipping my toe in the crypto world. So you, you gotta, you, you know, so much. You, we gotta talk about crypto. Uh, yeah, I mean, we could talk about. There's a pretty cool chart here, uh, which is Bitcoin volatility, uh, 90 day volatility versus gold in the late 20th century. Now, I will say this is mild chart crime here. We're operating on two very different axes, so. You can kind of look in my head. I kind of think of Bitcoin as a hundred vol asset. It's actually slightly lower than that now. Uh, gold, while the pattern is similar, you know, you're kind of looking at gold as being something around, you know, between a ten and at the very highest a seventy or eighty vol asset. Um, you know, in the 1980s, I think overall, it, it's fair to look at. I think it's always been fair to look at Bitcoin as something like a high beta, high volatility gold because it is. You know, there's a guy named John Pfeffer. He, uh, you know, he was, a, I think, a partner at KKR for a long period of time. He wrote this very influential piece, an inf uh, institutional investor's take on Bitcoin. And he came on an early webinar at BlockWorks, and he kind of talked about Bitcoin as a, it's like a venture investment in a new store of value. So all the properties, the, the risk profile that you'd get from investing in an early stage startup, you're getting with Bitcoin. What makes it particularly unique is that you're not investing in a startup company, you're investing in a startup currency. And I think that's ultimately a pretty good way of looking at something like Bitcoin in general. So, you know, Bitcoin continues to be kind of the king. And what 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 makes them really interesting is I, I think there are two very interesting observations to make about Bitcoin, which is that 
people, no one else is really even trying to compete with Bitcoin for its use case right now. It's very interesting. It's very like Google in that regard, right? In that nobody really creates, nobody's out here funding new search companies, right? I know there's DuckDuckGo and Bing, but let's be real. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure Google has like 96% market share or something like that. Similarly, there's Doge and stuff like that. I think that, I don't really know how to interpret Doge. I kind of think it's a joke. I don't know, whatever. But, you know, no one is really seriously competing with Bitcoin. So that's a very bullish case for it. The bearish case for Bitcoin is that I am a firm believer in the youth and the youth opinion as a as a guide for investment. And, you know, when you when you talk to a lot of the class of 2021 or young kids coming into this space, which I think is a really good barometer for where the sector is going in general. I mean, Bitcoin is already the boomer coin. It's a joke, but I mean... It's not really a joke. Memes have power. It is, it's the boomer coin. It's the old thing. Uh, so in that regard, that's like kind of a not super bullish thing for Bitcoin. So I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, I, I guess I always just default to it's the king. It's why we're all here. It has this unbelievable story and narrative around this and this like immaculate conception, fair launch type thing. I think it's basically impossible to replicate it anymore. It's got this narrative around it, which is basically religion. Yeah, I think if you want to understand Bitcoin, it's really important to understand dynamics around religion and heretics and stuff like that. I think they're, you know, Martin Luther's uh, Reformation and stuff like that. Look at the impact that that had on the Catholic Church. I don't know. That's my rant. <laughs> um, that's, that's my rant about Bitcoin. But I don't know what takeaways you have when you look at this chart of uh, Bitcoin vol versus gold. I think the fact that it's now known as a boomer coin might not be bearish. It could be bullish. Betting against boomers mm. has been a horrible stra investment strategy for the past 40 years. I look at bonds, look at stocks. So <laughs> that being point. said, that yeah. that's where I'll leave all my, my bullish behind on Bitcoin. I, I think right now, obviously, it's just a mm. a beta to crypto. So that you know that if you if crypto continues to go up, that will be uh, good. But when you say no one's almost competing with Bitcoin, I assume you're referring to it as a store of value. And isn't a Mike, isn't a store of value mm. a politically correct, polite way of saying doing nothing? Like, what does gold do? You know what I mean? <laughs> Like it's it's a store of value, well of of course, but uh, you know, and here's where my crypto knowledge is very weak, and as you will see, but you know, isn't the code for Litecoin almost identical to Bitcoin? The only difference is the narrative that Bitcoin has been blessed because it was the mm. first, and Litecoin is merely an imposter. Uh, so mm. I, I think I think right now, Bitcoin has that beta to crypto, uh, so it's not like this risk that I'm about to talk about will take, take, take effect anywhere, anytime soon. But if all of the technology and development and the metaverse and DeFi, if all that happens on Ethereum, on Solana, all the, on the other L1s, see, now I'm getting familiar with the, uh, the, 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 the lingo. Um, <laughs> Look at you. Look at you, Jack. The then, <laughs> then Bitcoin is nothing but like a 15 year call option that Bitcoin will be adopted as a reserve asset. If not by central banks, then mm. by almost everyone. And, Options decay. That's all I'll say. Yeah. So a couple, I guess a couple of responses to that in general. So, so store value is interesting. Store value, that line, I don't know if you've noticed, is creeping into just about everything uh, in terms of like stocks now get described as a store of value in general. Uh, I, I feel like it's actually kind of an overused buzzword, but it does kind of give you a sense of where folks' heads are at, right? Which when there's inflation, you're protected, not you're, you're really concerned with protecting your wealth in real terms, not necessarily in nominal terms. Um, I think really great investors, a mark of a really great investor is being comfortable with some form of arbitrariness, something that's arbitrary. So what I mean by that is, you know, people will kind of, you've, you've maybe seen these things on Twitter where you're matching up gold versus Bitcoin and here are the attributes of sound money, right? It's divisible, it's portable, it's yada, yada. So I think that there is some aspect to that, right? There are attributes that make gold a good store of value. There are attributes that make Bitcoin a good store of value. In general, though, the reason why we have things like gold and Bitcoin is because there's something needs to be a store of value. The, the only thing that really does end up giving it value at the end of the day is the belief, right? And by the way, if you dig deep enough, that's the only thing that really gives anything value is narratives and stories and collective human belief in general. So a lot, I think a lot of investors look at that. And they're like, but I can't fit it into a model. I can't match it up. Where are the cash flows? And this is kind of that like classic bell curve meme where that you're just confined to the middle of the bell curve because you can't produce cash flow and something like that. Um, you know, I, I have been vocal on other podcasts where I do 
I do personally believe in productive assets. I think the ratio of something like Bitcoin to, uh, you know, other, you know, L1s, right? Ethereum and Solana and Avalanche and the apps that are getting built on top of that. I think the ratio of Bitcoin to the rest of the crypto market cap is going to look something like the ratio of gold to equities plus stocks in general. But I think there's going to be a need for pristine collateral that Bitcoin is going to fulfill because, you know, just look at debt to GDP in general right now in the world. There is certainly, it looks like we're on the verge of a pretty large credit crisis. So I do think, you know, attribute side, there is a demand for something that people believe is pristine and scarce and somewhere where they don't have to worry about leaks in the credit system, in, in the fiat system. So I don't know, man. I, I think there's I think there's a decent chance. And, and to your point that options decay and value will get built elsewhere, you're really talking about kind of two different things. Like crypto, is a, it's, a, it's a multifaceted beast. It's just to cement in your mind, Jack, that this is all a bubble. This is a paradigm shift, <laughs> I do believe. And there are two frameworks of looking at it. One is that it's a monetary framework, which is how Bitcoin maximalists look at things. And then there's another belief that this is an evolution. This is a technology revolution, which is kind of how the Web3 ETH crowd looks at everything. I ultimately think at the end of the day, it's funny because the Bitcoin maxis, they, they tend to hate on uh, you know, other platforms as stealing value from Bitcoin. Right? I think a lot of them look at it and say, Bitcoin is the best. If we only had Bitcoin, Bitcoin would be much higher, et cetera. I think there's a really good chance that at the end of the day, the crypto economy and this need for pristine collateral that's digitally native in the, in the way that Bitcoin is, I think that ends up driving a lot of the value. Uh, for Bitcoin in the future, i.e. there are economic systems that get built on alternative layer ones like Ethereum, Solana, Avalanche, but people still have this preference for holding what they believe is pristine collateral, store value, very sound. So I almost think the demand for Bitcoin on those alternative chains is going to be the biggest driver for demand for Bitcoin into the future. I see Bitcoin as being very non-competitive with Ethereum, you know, some of these other newer chains. Now, I think Ethereum and Avalanche and Solana directly compete with one another, but I, I actually see the growth of those alternative chains as being complementary to Bitcoin, not as something that competes with it, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I agree with you. I, I don't think that uh, Bitcoin will, over the next five years, drastically, un uh, if not underperform, I don't think like Bitcoin will go down 50% while Ethereum and everything else is up 1000%. I, I don't think that. Although, Mike, we were joking because you said I have to have like sort of a, a take, a view, a framework. Uh, but I was joking that what if my, my, I could just become a Solana guy. I, I could go 400% long uh, Solana, 80% short Bitcoin, so that I'm 320% net long uh, um, uh, crypto, but I just have that sort of like short long Bitcoin. But yes, to be clear, I'm, I'm not short position uh bitcoin that that is a joke it's complicated it's complicated i mean it's a, there's there's a lot of information to swallow here in this ecosystem and at the end of the day anyone who says that they know how this is going to all play out is either trying to sell you something or they're needlessly confident right and they're probably not the type of person that you should be listening to anyway i think you know strong beliefs loosely held um i i really do i really do believe in that um and i i think at the end of the day it's just fun to to watch this whole ecosystem play out and develop and a lot of the stuff that we're talking about now the metaverse that wasn't even a thing six months ago and now you got facebook rebranding to meta you got microsoft leaning in you got adidas joining the board api club part of this makes me think uh top signal top signal top signal you know but uh i you know at the end of the day you know it probably does show that there's some some juice and some weight there um and I, sorry i will say quickly about about bitcoin uh to say about as a store of value, one thing where it actually, that is a real use case, is if people are, are fleeing a country as a refugee, such as like the czar, or you know, uh, uh, Russian nobles fleeing uh, from in 1917, like they would store diamonds and that's a store of value. Likewise, like pe people fleeing countries can do that with Bitcoin. And I actually think that uh, if you look at the huge devaluation in the Turkish Lira last summer, that coincided a mm. lot with the beginning of the epic bull run in Bitcoin, or I should say the next leg, the leg that we all remember. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that Turkish Lira devalued a ton over the past two weeks. So who knows? I mean, people always tend to make it about that. I think it doesn't need to be any more complicated than millennials are going to have a preference for Bitcoin over gold. There is a very consistent demand for a store value over periods of time in human history. I am a believer in the nominal system. I'm a believer in a credit-based system. And people that point it and say it's a sham, it's a fraud, I don't know what to tell you, man. Like, 
there's there's been credit crunches in the past. These things do tend to get resolved and worked out. And if you want to just have this system where no one has to believe in each other, no credit, what you're advocating for is no cooperation between humanity. That's what the only thing that separates us from the monkeys at the end of the day. So I don't I just really can't get behind or advocate for that system. We need to work together. But I do think that you can see kind of a consistent demand for when we start believing in each other too much or things get out of whack, people want an asset to fall back into. At the end of the day, for the new generation that is a digitally native generation, they believe in Bitcoin more than they believe in gold. And I just think that you're going to see market share continue to reflect that over long periods of time as demographics change. I'm not sure that it needs to get any more complicated than that. It's like this is that 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 bell curve meme, right? Which is that millennials like Bitcoin and 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 they're going to be more millennials and they're going to have more money. So what do you think is going to happen? I don't know. It's uh, um, unfortunately, actually, we, we got to wrap here. That's that's all the time that we have. But uh, Jack, this has been a ton of fun, my man. Um, I'm sure this is the first of many collabs that we'll do together. But it's been a blast, my friend. It has been a blast. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, two things I want to quickly say uh, for viewers who are looking at the steep sell off, the sea monsters underneath, I would uh, uh, see maybe they could look at Alibaba. Uh, they could look at Zoom. Mm. And perhaps if they really want to dumpster dive and really get in the bottom of the, the dumpster where it's the smelliest, they could look at something called Wish, which is down something like 90%. <laughs> So and I also want to plug my own podcast, which mm. is on Blockworks, called For Guidance. This will air on December 4th, Saturday. So uh, yesterday, I uh, aired an interview with William White. That is Dr. William White, the former chief economist of the Bank of International Settlements. He has a true insider's glimpse into what central bankers are actually thinking. Uh, it is, you know, one of my top favorite interviews that I've done in my entire career. Uh, you know, and I think that uh, you should watch it. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Yeah, just get right yeah. to it. Awesome, man. Um, we all, I will certainly give it a watch and viewers of the show, you absolutely should as well. Jack, thanks so much for hopping on today. I'll see you soon, my friend. Thank you so much, Mike. Take care.